Okay, cool. Thanks, Avery, for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. If you'd like to share your screen or um, just talk, you're welcome to do any of that and uh, love to uh, hear what you have to say. Okay, awesome. And thank you all for your introductions. Um, yeah, I'll, I, have a, I have a PowerPoint, but as Dr. Hedegren said, like I'm fine, just like if you guys raise your hands or if you guys just interrupt me at any point, or if you're on Zoom, feel free to uh, just put something in the chat, that's fine. I'll have it open on this screen over here, hopefully, and then I'll be sharing my screen over here. Let me see if I can do that. Um, and um, I hope this is okay. Okay, oh, sweet. I always forget how Zoom works anyways. Um, I, uh, I, I know it's called Data Science and Industrial Systems, um, but that's basically because I took these slides from a different presentation. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about um, my career path, um, just because it seems like that's that would maybe be of interest a little bit what I did in industry, um, what classes I found useful in school, um, and then what it's like now to be on my own and, and do consulting. Um, and I also have slides in here that also talk about more applications of data science and industrial systems. Um, so we can also get into those, but we could also just do questions too. Um, so if you guys, like I said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to just raise your hand. We'll stop right in the middle of it and uh, we'll we'll get going. Um, okay, sweet. Let's see, how do I, there we go. So I'll talk a little bit about who I am, my journey, what I learned, what is data science, why data science, some applications. I don't know if we're gonna get through all this. I guess also Dr. Hedengard, what, when, what, Am I speaking for five hours or when, when, when are we yeah, done? It's, it's just a three hour class today. So you're good. <laughs> you're good keep going. Now you get, uh, so we, we need to end about uh, 1250 or so. Okay, sounds good. Um, we'll just, like I said, if you guys have questions, it's kind of a very loose agenda. Okay, so first, who am I? My name is Avery Smith. Um, you can add me on LinkedIn, as Dr. Hedengrid said. I'm pretty active on, on LinkedIn. Um, I try to post pretty much every single day. And uh, it's been an awesome experience for me to build my personal brand. Um, it's allowed me to really do, I started doing this about a year ago, I would say. Um, and it's really helped me be able to uh, work for myself now and, and do consulting. So um, I'm, I, I post helpful data science tips and just, I don't know, life stuff. Like I, I talked about, I'm gonna do a marathon, my first marathon tomorrow. Um, so this is my QR code. If you scan it, you should be able to add me, go ahead and add me. I would love to have all of you guys in my network um, because I am local. I went to the University of Utah. Um, so that's, that's actually kind of interesting because I didn't go to BYU, um, but I, I'm a member of the church. I served a mission. I always grew up thinking I was going to go to BYU and then somehow something just happened. I just uh, didn't make it, I guess. I made it to the U. Um, yeah, so um, I graduated in 2019, which is about two years ago, um, with a chemical engineering degree. Um, and then I immediately started my master's right after that, um, that fall, and I'll be graduating. Let's see, the end of this summer is my last semester. I just have my um, last semester, which is just a, a giant project. So um, Dr. Hedengren actually kind of already mentioned it. I'm fortunate enough and I have, I have built up my network over the last year to the point where I somehow got the Utah Jazz to let me do uh, a semester's worth of analytics for them. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I got that through posting on LinkedIn. Um, I was a data scientist while I was actually an undergrad at the University of Utah for a company called VaporSense. I'll go into a little bit about that. And then I interned with ExxonMobil in between my junior and senior year. And then I went to work full-time for Exxon right upon graduating. I worked there for about a little over a year and a half. Um, and then I recently quit in January um, because I had, done, I had been doing consulting on the side for about a year. And it was to the point where I had enough customers and enough clients that I felt comfortable doing my own thing. And um, uh, I won't obviously, you know, oil and gas has really struggled the last few years or last year, I guess. Um, and I didn't really love working in industry and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So any questions so far? Good so far, okay. Um, okay, so this is, this is my first job and this is how I got started in, in data science. I actually, so I'm a chemical engineer, freshman year, I work in a lab 
Um, I'm just like, I, I want to find, I want to like figure out what chemical engineers do. Cause I, I just knew that I liked math and I liked chemistry. Um, turns out I really just liked math and I just really didn't like the chemistry, but oh well, too late. Um, and uh, so I ended up working in a lab for free, just like doing volunteer research for about three months um, in, a, in a metallurgical engineering lab. So I worked with ICP EMS, so mass spec on iron compounds. And uh, I worked there for free and uh, I applied for some jobs afterwards and ended up landing a job as a um, lab technician for a company called VaporSense. And basically what VaporSense does is teach computers to smell. So they make these devices that basically have the power to sniff whatever's in the air, what chemicals there, how much of that chemical is there. Um, and so I built these sensors. You, I have a picture right here of the sensors. Each one of these little ones is an organic semiconductor that basically captures electrons from the air. Um, and this device basically reads it into a computer and we can track the, um, let's see if I can remember the current across these organic semiconductors and based on the electrons either donating or accepting electrons from the organic semiconductors that change in um, current can be mapped back to what chemical it is and how much of that chemical is present and so i was just a lab technician i was just making these sensors and testing them and we had a data scientist um, but he ended up quitting after i was there for like three months and we spent like the next six months trying to hire a data scientist. Um, and it was difficult. I mean, this was, you know, five, six, six years ago and data science wasn't as popular as it is now. And there wasn't as, we wanted someone with like a scientific background and the computer science background. And it was just hard to find the right combination. And eventually I was like, well, I know how to program and I know some stats. I was like, how hard can it be? I'll just like figure it out on my own. Um, and I ended up making a program that basically automated some of our analysis for us. And I talked to my boss and I was like, hey, is this useful? And he was like, yeah, you should do more of that. And so eventually I stopped doing all of my lab technician work and I just transitioned fully into doing data analysis. Um, and I was there for basically all four years of college, um, off and on a couple of times. I took a break for a while, um, but I, I basically led this small company. I only had about 10 people when I hired on and now it's about 25 people, but I, I was like leading their data science. <laughs> so it was a very weird experience for me, but I learned a heck of a lot. Um, and I loved working for a small company where I could do something like this because this would never fly at a big company, just like some random student, like just leading your team in data science, that would never happen. Um, so it was an awesome experience. Got to work with drug detection, um, bomb detection. I got to like work with like explosive materials and meth. Like I had access to meth. I didn't, I didn't like use it at all. You know, <laughs> I had access to it whenever I wanted. Like it was, it was a really fun job. Um, and I, I really actually miss working there to be honest. Um, so I took a, my first break from X or from uh, vapor sense to go work for Exxon mobile um, in between my junior and senior year um, where I was my, my, I guess my official title was an optimization engineer intern, but that's just a fancy word to say you do data science. Um, and that's, that's something I try to preach is like, you don't have to be a data scientist to do data science. That's like saying you have to be a mathematician to do math. And it's like, well, all of you guys are like, you know, engineers or some sort of technical degree and like you guys use math. Right. Um, so I think the same about data science. Um, so uh, technically, I was an optimization engineer, and basically what that means is, and Dr. Hedengren, remind me, were you mostly in the upstream when you worked for Exxon? Is that correct? Uh, well, I've, I've done a lot of research in upstream, uh -huh. doing, but uh, I was mostly in chemicals. Oh, you were mostly in chemicals. Okay. And um, my, I guess my mentor, uh, Cody Powell, he was more in the downstream. Um, he's a professor for University of Utah. Um, so so anyways, I guess for, for those not familiar with, with the oil and gas sector. Downstream means like refining, chemicals means making plastic, and upstream means getting oil out of the ground. Um, and so I was in a pretty cool position in the downstream research um, arm of ExxonMobil. And it was basically making refinery decision support tools. So what, what basically I have a picture of here is it's kind of a crappy picture, but you can see these are different crude oils. So some of these you know, are darker, so like this one's really dark. And then this one right here is Eagle Ford condensate, and that's kind of light. And then I have Syncrude on the far right, that's also kind of light. 
But crude oil from all is from all over different places in the world, and it's very different, right? Um, some of it's really heavy and really sulfurous. Some of it's really light and really clean. And some, I mean, obviously it's good to be light and clean. That makes for gasoline. And most, most of the uh, market is in gasoline. Um, but you also need to make jet fuel, which requires a heavier uh, crude oil. And so you're basically, as a refinery, you're trying to, number one, make money. Number two, not break any of the environmental rules. Okay. And number three, it's kind of a sub of number one, but, but fill the market needs. So the market's going to need, you know, I don't know the exact numbers. Let's just say 400 kilobarrels of jet fuel and, you know, 900 kilobarrels of gasoline. You need to be able to fill that as a refinery. And so you're constantly trying to figure out, okay, well, where should I order my crudes? Should I order them from Mexico? Should I order them from Canada? Should I get them from England? You're trying to like always keep in mind, like what crudes um, should I buy so I can make the right products at the lowest cost and have the biggest margin? And that's like a giant math problem at the end of the day. So we'd, we'd make giant optimization problems. We'd basically take a refinery and create a model of the entire refinery and use optimization techniques to find the optimal crude basket is what they call it, to purchase. So we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna buy 100, 100 barrels from Mexico, 50 barrels from Canada and 20, 20 barrels from Norway. And that's going to allow us to make the right amount of gasoline, the right amount of kerosene, the right amount of diesel, whatever. Um, and so that's, that's actually kind of an, an automated decision that we make as a refinery at ExxonMobil, or we try to make it as automated as possible. So I spent um, a lot of time, a lot of my time at Exxon working on this one problem. Um, I guess my internship was about half of that and half of it was, was using this model for other decisions, trying to decide when we should update our capital investments like piping, heat exchanger, stuff like that, and which ones we should prioritize. And that's the one that, that Exxon thinks is the real money maker. And I legally cannot talk much about it because they think it's, it's pretty sweet. Um, some other things, okay, I guess any questions there before I move on? Okay, sounds good. Like I said, you can put it in the chat or you can just raise your hand. Um, we're gonna get to more like less about me and more just about other stuff. Um, these are some other projects I did while I was working at Exxon. So you can kind of think um, how this might, uh, you know, work for you and your careers. Um, I spent a decent amount of time looking at vendor tools. So ExxonMobil, and I'm going to get into this in the industry section, but ExxonMobil is a manufacturing company. It is not a tech company, believe it or not. You, you might be shocked. ExxonMobil is not a tech company. It is a manufacturing company. It is barrel in equals dollar out. That is like their bottom line. That's how they make money. That's what they care about. And so for a lot of things, like for instance, if we go back to this, this optimization you know, tool that I talked about, you could either make it on your own or you could buy it from someone else, for instance, okay? And so I made, they rather buy it from someone else just because it's not their bread and butter to you know, make software. Exxon doesn't make software. It barrel in equals dollar out, that's what they want. And so I looked at a lot of third-party vendor tools which was not my favorite thing, but it was like, okay, can we use this tool to make our lives easier? Um, I also did a lot of dashboards. So being able to like see the results of what crudes we bought, why we bought them, you know, what products we're planning on making. Um, and in that, obviously there's a lot of way to make dashboards. I don't know how familiar you are with dashboards, but there's stuff like Tableau and Power BI that are kind of drag and drop, click, self-serve dashboard programs. So I evaluate a lot of those. Um, there's also ones that are more complex. Like I do for now in consulting, I do a lot of dashboards and most of the time I'm building them from scratch using Python. Those, there's kind of way offs between the two. Um, I hosted and taught an analytics club at ExxonMobil that got to about 300 people um, by the time I left. Um, so we had usually about 100 people on our phone calls every other week that where we'd, we'd teach about analytics. We'd have someone come in or we would teach about analytics. And I also uh, got the chance to participate in a couple uh, company analytics like crowdsourcing uh, competitions that were really fun. Um, lucky enough to win, a, win two of those. Um, really enjoyed those. Um, other things that I did, I guess I should say, so I interned as an optimization engineer where I was mostly working on, on that supply chain problem of modeling a refinery and then making it, making it work really well. 
Um, and then I eventually, the last six months of Exxon, <clears throat> moved over to an actual data science, like it was called a data scientist position, where I worked on things like supply predictions. So trying to predict how much, uh, for instance, like literally, like how much um, diesel should we send to the Salt Lake City terminal? Trying to predict that and automate that process um, because it changes quite drastically throughout the year. You might not realize this, but you actually drive a lot more in the summer. And so when you take like a hundred or like I guess in Utah's case, like three or 4 million of you and you guys are all driving in the summer, you actually need a lot more gasoline than you do in the winter because you don't drive as much, you don't take as many road trips, there's not as much snow. So trying to predict that can be quite difficult because you don't want to send too little to a terminal because then you run out, right? You, you're like, oh, sorry, we don't have any gasoline left, we're out, and you miss sales there. But you don't wanna to have too much that your tanks overfill and you have to sell some on a discount. So you wanna to try to get the exact amount right. Um, kind of similar, I spent some time trying to predict what shipping costs might be. So obviously it's not trivial to send crude oil from Sockland, Russia to Houston, Texas. Um, that costs a lot of money. And if you can know how much money that's going to cost, you can kind of do some hedging and save money on the long run. So a lot of these things were, were like engineering related, but a lot of it is business, right? A lot of it was supply chain logistics. So even though I was a chemical engineer slash data scientist, I was just spending a lot of time working on the business. Um, the last thing I did, the thing I'm most proud of at my time at Exxon probably was I, I made an app called Go To Get Plant Data that basically gave engineers easier access to their data. Um, and this is one of the reasons I ended up kind of leaving because this, this was a really awesome product and a really cool idea. And it got a lot of traction with a lot of people, like a lot of engineers, um, but the bureaucracy of management kind of made it really difficult and I was, I was kind of frustrated. So that's one of the reasons I ended up leaving. Okay, and then finally, sorry, any questions? Yeah, just a quick question we got from the chat. From yep. Uh, what was your process for teaching yourself the data science techniques, especially like in your first job with VaporSense where you're a technician and then you saw an opportunity? How did you do that? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I was, and I think it's really changed from now. I think the, the whole data science education scene has really changed. Uh, I think there's a lot more class, I mean like this class, right? Um, I think was, was just kind of maybe pretty new um, and there's not even like this class equivalent at the University of Utah, really. Um, so I think it's really changed. Um, and I'll actually, I think, hold on, let's see. We can fast forward to this. These are, these are classes that helped me transition to data science. So I, take a, I took a numerical methods class as like a freshman slash sophomore. So UChemies, I think take a similar class at BYU. Um, I took a statistics for engineers class uh, as an undergrad and that really helped get me like a good statistics background. The University of Utah had um, an intro to data science class um, that I took that was very useful. Um, I took smart systems from Cody Powell, which, which was, a, when I took it, was open to BYU students as well. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, I wish I took this class or one of Dr. Hedengren's class that was available for University of Utah students. I was about to, and then I took a stupid uh, like oil and gas class that was really useless. So regrets, but what can you do? Um, and then linear algebra and calculus. So those are maybe like more formal classes that I found very helpful. Um, and at the very end, we can just skip there for a little bit. Um, I give some resources that I really like. Let's see, right here. Um, Towards data science and Kaggle.com are like the best places on the internet to self-learn, I think. Um, those have like Towards data science has like a lot of really well-written articles about like applications of data science in different industries. I really like them. Kaggle has like competitions and notebooks that you can kind of read and see how people have done data science previously. Um, it also has some brief courses. And now there's a bunch of courses like Data Camp and like Code Academy that have cheap slash free learning. Um, but for me, the biggest things were Kaggle and towards data science. And then the actual documentation of the um, of the different packages I ended up using in Python. I'm sure you can attest to that, Dr. Hedengren, that you know, in, in Gecko, you probably do a fair amount of, of examples in, in your documentation that kind of explain things at least a little bit. Yep. And, and learning on the job. I, I'm a big fan of 
and this is how I I did it. Like I got really lucky that I worked for a small company where they didn't really care and they couldn't really find the right person. And I was cheap. And I was, to be honest, I was, I was fairly okay at it um, where I could get paid to learn it, you know, as I went on the job. I think whenever you can get paid to learn in your life, I think always take that opportunity um, instead of paying to learn. Um, and then of course, there's, there's ways you could further your education. Like I ended up getting a master's degree from Georgia Tech that obviously taught me some things. Thank you for the question though, appreciate it. Um, I'll quickly just get into you know what I do now and then we'll get into question and answers. Um, I now run a little analytics firm called Snow Data Science. Um, like I said, I had been, after I left, uh, after I graduated college, it went to Exxon full-time, um, VaporSense called me and they're like, hey, like uh, we have some more projects that we want you to do. And I was like, okay, sweet. So on, on, on evenings and, and weekends, I would work for VaporSense kind of freelancing and consulting. On weekdays, I'd work for Exxon. Um, and I start, so I kind of already had started consulting and freelancing and working remotely. Um, and then I got started on a website called Upwork where you can, you can you know, have a profile and you can apply to different projects that other, other companies post. Um, and I had been freelancing on my, you know, afternoons and weekends for about a year. And I built, built up a good enough network where I felt comfortable that, like, hey, I could do this full time. Um, so I went ahead and made the jump in January and started this business where I basically do projects, data science projects for different companies. Um, and I also do education. So that's kind of what it talks about here as I do consulting and freelancing. Ironically, I do very little data science engineering work, like data science in industrial systems or engineering, which is kind of my background, like in science and in, in, in like engineering and manufacturing. I do very little there, which is kind of ironic. And I saw we had a, a decent amount of um, cybersecurity students, right? Raise your hand, cybersecurity people. All right, nice. Um, my biggest client right now is in cybersecurity. So I, I probably do, I spend the last two months, I've probably spent half my time working for a cybersecurity company. Um, and the other half of what I do is education. So I help other people break in data science um, through online courses. Um, so right now I'm rolling out a new course called Data Career Jumpstart, where I basically help engineers, geologists, you know, scientists, business people, basically use the education they have right now and just add data science as like a superpower. Because like I said earlier, you don't have to be a data scientist to do data science. I strongly believe that. Um, so that's kind of my, my most recent project that I'm working on. I'm also trying to help people um, build a personal brand because I a lot of opportunities that I have have kind of fallen in my lap just because I spent the last year posting on LinkedIn. Um, I don't, like it's just kind of magical. <laughs> you, you basically your name just gets seen every single day and people think about you. Um, and so I, I'm a big fan of building personal brands. So that's that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Um, okay, and then I'm just going to go ahead and open it up for any questions. Um, and I have a couple more slides about things I wish school taught me, what I thought of industry, and then we can go into why I left Exxon. And if you guys, you know, want any examples of of types of analytics or a few examples of data science in like more industrial systems, we can get into that. But for now, I'm just going to go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, you guys can ask me anything you want. <laughs> Okay, we got some questions. Okay. So, um, you know, you have a huge following on LinkedIn, you know, me included. Do you see, I mean, do you see data science becoming kind of saturated or oversaturated in the coming years because of how many people want to break into data science? Um, I mean, obviously more saturated than it is right now. Um, but I don't, you know, it's kind of like the, um, and I know, I know nothing about this. So if you know like a bunch about real estate, then like, and I'm dead wrong, go ahead and, you know, tell me because I don't know anything about real estate. But it's kind of like right now in Utah, especially we're in this like real estate bubble, right? Where it's like, there's a shortage of homes, but there's a lot of people who want homes. And so house prices are kind of skyrocketing. And it's like, okay, is this a bubble or is this going to last? And for me, I guess you can kind of think of this as like the data science bubble. I think, I think there's going to be more jobs. Like, I think, I think data scientists will probably be more 
like a software developer, like the like the rarity or how many jobs there are. I think there'll be a lot of data science jobs. With that, you might see a slight salary decrease because um, right now I think like the median uh, salary for a data scientist is like 115,000 or something like that. So you know that might drop 10k or something like that. But I still think it's definitely worth getting into because for me, I. I'm just going to be honest. I hated engineering work. I really just didn't like it. Um, and I found that out about my sophomore year. And I was like, do I switch to computer science? Um, what do I do? You know? Um, and so for me, it's been a lot of fun to have data science as a career. I feel like it allows me to be more creative. And of course, a lot of my friends like are, you know, during COVID, I was able to work from home the whole time. Right. Which isn't, which some people like, some people don't. Um, but a lot of my friends were like in the manufacturing plants, like in Baton Rouge or in Beaumont, Texas. And for me, I love working from home and I love working remotely. And I just, I know it's possible to do that as an engineer for sure. I think it's way harder to do. It's just a little bit easier when you only need your computer <laughs> and you're not in a manufacturing plant. So I think that was kind of a long answer, but I think there'll obviously be a lot more people who want to be data scientists, but I think there's going to be a lot more jobs. And I still think it's like, going to be worth it. I don't see like a, like a bubble popping in data science. Thanks for the question. Other hands. I have a question, Avery. Um, so you mentioned that you don't need to be a data scientist to use data science. So if you're planning on staying more on like a career as engineer, what part of data science would you say to focus on? Does that mean? Uh, did you say what, 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 what industry are you in, I guess? Uh, so I'm a chemical engineer. Okay. Um, yeah, because I think I think that's the interesting thing is is data science is also so broad. It really depends on what industry you're in. So, for instance, um, cybersecurity guys, right? Like you're looking at logs a lot of the time, and logs are words a lot of the time. And so you're dealing with a lot of data science that uses NLP or natural language processing, or it's like computers understanding words. I'm going to be honest. As a chemical engineer, NLP is pretty useless for you because there's not a whole lot of word data. Um, but there was examples at Exxon where we used N N NLP, but like it was pretty rare. So for you, like in, in, in the chemical industry, I, I think um, what, what I did um, in my undergraduate research with Dr. Powell was pretty, pretty impactful. Um, anomaly detection, figuring out when something breaks, like being able to tell exactly when it breaks, what broke and what caused it. You can use a lot of data science there. Um, I think a lot of supply chain and logistics is really big in the chemicals industry, you know, being able to predict pricing. So I would focus probably more on anomaly detection and like some sort of regression where you're able to predict some sort of outcome from some sort of inputs. Um, but like, but like you wouldn't necessarily want to focus. And I, I kind of have, let me go to the slide real fast. I kind of have this slide right here of like all these different words that you hear in in data science and data analytics in general and like for you i'd probably focus on machine learning like deep learning is probably like too much like you probably it's probably overkill you definitely don't want to worry about like cloud computing because you're probably going to have hopefully someone else that can do that for you so i'd probably focus on like the machine learning and like maybe maybe some of like the business intelligence sections of like like okay can you make a dashboard can you use tableau can you use power bi can you just like automate your job, parts of your job using data science? Because that's another thing is, is like, I, I like data science for a lot of reasons. And I say, you can be, you can use data science without being a data scientist. Like I had a friend who worked for NBC and he's a brilliant data scientist. And like, he basically automated a lot of his job where he didn't really need to do anything. And I think, I think there's a lot of analysis that engineers do that could definitely be sped up um, and modernized. So another long-winded answer, but I, I would say if you're in chemicals, you know, focus on can you do multivariate linear regression and can you do some sort of anomaly detection? Um, if so, you're probably in good shape. And then just add some sort of like descriptive analytics tool like Power BI or dashboards or something like that. Good question. You got any other questions? Also from the, our online participants, if you want to just unmute, um, feel free to ask questions um, if you'd like to participate. Um, 
Okay, any other questions here? I have a question here. No one has one. Okay, Sam has a question here too. So my question is, how much of your time or what percentage of your projects do you, do you develop? In what, I guess, uh, in how many of your projects do you have to develop the business case versus the company reaching out to you and be like, okay, this is what we need, we just need someone to do it for us. Okay, that's a good question. And I'm actually gonna go to a slide to, to answer that. Um, what I thought of industry. Um, I think it really depends on where you work. Um, and this is one reason why I ended up leaving Exxon was because, and one reason why I really miss Vapor Sense. I don't miss it enough to go back, but I do miss working there. Um, is it really depends on your industry and the size of your company. So at Exxon Mobil, it's very rare where I ever came up with a business use case. Very rare. Um, just because like, if you think about it, there's so many levels of management. So there's a CEO and then there's a VP and then there's a senior VP and then there's like a division leader and then there's a group leader and then there's a department leader and then there's another group leader and then there's you. It's like you are so far down from making any like to be honest any important decisions. Um, and I hated that because I saw I mean you'll see you'll see right here, I saw so many wasted like opportunities and so much wasted money. Like, like, I mean, obviously Exxon's a very like wealthy company. They obviously have a ton of revenue. Like, I can't tell you how many, like literally millions of dollars I saw that I was like, hey, I could solve that. Um, and even one, one of the times I, I did, that was kind of the go-to get plant data thing I talked about. Um, I like saw a, a huge need at the company and I had already written like 75% of the code to solve it. I just needed, I wrote it too specific. I just needed to generalize it. And so I ended up generalizing it. Um, and it was like a huge plus for our company. All these engineers really liked it, but management was very mixed about it because I did it on my own um, and they didn't really like that. So that was like a, a time where I saw a use case and I was like, I'm going to fix the problem. Um, and they didn't really allow it. <laughs> At Vapor Sense though, it was the exact opposite. If I saw anything, as long as it wasn't going to take like months to make, they're like, yeah, do it. Like, if you think that's going to work, go ahead and do it. And like, oh, like you think that's a good idea. Okay, go ahead and do that. So I, that's where I personally found out I really liked working for a small company just because it allows you to have like a bigger seat at the table and allows you to come up with some of those business use cases and then actually, you know, kind of dream it and then go out and build it. Um, at Exxon, it wasn't really, you're more of a cog in the machine. So your boss says, hey, they want to do this. And you say, okay, sounds good. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, that's exactly. Thank you. So, so how much of your freelance work? I mean, what do people generally want? Do they need more help with data visualization? Because I know that you do a lot of that, or do they need more machine learning applications? Um, a lot. It's it's that's also why I'm pretty confident that. Um, I don't think the, there's going to be a drop in data science jobs available, is that a lot of the projects I do right now are pretty basic. Um, it's pretty rare where I have like a pretty intense machine learning problem to solve. Most of what I do right now is just dashboard building with some like data cleaning and some data processing and maybe like some analytics on, on the back end. But a lot of what I do right now is just like making graphs, uh, making dashboards and doing descriptive analytics. Um, so I, that's probably where I see the most of my jobs is from you know, that field of just making dashboards and stuff. Um, but I have had projects obviously where, where we use more intense data science. They're, they're, they're a little bit rarer, rarer I would say. Um, and it also depends on, I'm still trying to figure out, like I'll be completely honest with you, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing like 100% of the time. Um, because at first I was so scared that I wouldn't have any any jobs. I kind of took whatever came my way and that that led me down. Like I was doing like a million different things. Um, and now that I have, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna die. Like I, I don't, I'm not gonna like live in the street tomorrow. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a little bit more of what my actual speciality is. Um, but there's, I mean, there's all sorts of jobs but I spend most of my time doing dashboards. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and just 
this is something that I thought was was kind of interesting. Um, two slides, things that I wish school taught me. Um, number one is build your personal brand. I don't have like many regrets in my life at all. Um, and I'm, I'm like, I'm glad I got a chemical engineering degree, even though I use it like the actual, like the last time I solved like a mass transfer problem was probably like the final for mass transfer. Like I've never used mass transfer. I've used like some kinetics and obviously just like some problem solving in general. Um, and I'm, I don't regret like learning that stuff at all, but I wish in college, I would have built my personal brand earlier. Like I wish I would have been posting on LinkedIn once a week throughout college. Um, just because it would have given me a head start and people love to see the process. Sometimes we think that like, oh, we only want to see like a finished product, but like people are fascinated by watching the process. And so like, if I would have done like a weekly or even like a semester report, if I would have posted that on LinkedIn or on Medium um, and interacted more in those places, I feel like that just boosted everything. Because now like for instance, and Dr. Hedengren talked about this the other day, or he talked about this earlier. Um, I like, I mean, it's unpaid, it's for school, but I have like an internship with the jazz and I tried so hard as an undergraduate to get a job with the jazz. And I emailed all these people and I was talking to them. I could never get over the hump. And finally this last time I was like, hey, I wanna work for the jazz. And I posted on, on LinkedIn and I was like, if you wanna help me tag the jazz. And it ended up getting like, like, a million views and like 5,000 likes or something like that. And it ended up, you know, pushing me over the edge. And so I think sometimes we get so, and this is kind of the second thing that corporate jobs are the only way to make money. That's what we kind of think when we're in school. Um, but I think there's so many opportunities out there that we don't really realize that like, instead of spending, you know, a hundred hours, you know, applying to a hundred different jobs, maybe we should take a different approach and spend 50 hours applying to 50 different jobs and 50 hours, you know, talking about what we're learning in school somewhere on social media. I think sometimes we're so caught up in like, this is how we've done things previously. This is how we should always do things. Um, but I really think there's, especially with the internet now, I mean, my, what I do now would not be possible, you know, 30 years ago um, because I have zero clients in Utah, zero. And I worked in Texas and I had one client in Texas. So like just the internet has made everything a lot, a lot better. So that's just one thing I wish school would have taught me is there's not one path that you have to follow. I guess it did teach me that because I ended up taking a weird path. Um, but these are some other things that I just want, I wish someone would have talked to me when I was, you know, deciding where to work is you have to think about what industry you're in. A data science job. I mean, obviously you can, I, I want to be a data scientist. Like that's what I want to do. But I said, you guys can be engineers and just use data science. You just have to keep in mind that if you work for an engineering company, they're always going to prefer the engineers over the data science. Like that's just their bread and butter. So at Exxon, it was manufacturing. Like they are the people that make all the money. And so they get all the perks and like, that's what they want to focus on. Exxon didn't always want to innovate in the data science space because they rather innovate in the manufacturing space. That was just my experience. Um, and I talked about the bureaucracy of working for like a, for any company, I guess, but especially a big company. I often felt like I was a cog in the machine and I would just do what people told me to do, which is fine. Like I had a very cushy job at ExxonMobil. Like I never, I think once I worked more than 40 hours, like I never worked over 40 hours. Um, like I did fine. Um, it was a nice campus. I, I liked my job half the time. Um, but half the time it was like very monotonous, which is, which is fine for some people. And just for me, I couldn't handle it anymore. Um, but, but that was just kind of my experience in industry is there. Sometimes it was disappointing and I wanted to work for a company that was more innovative. And I only have experience at Exxon and I think they are innovative in different ways. Um, but just keep in mind, like, what is your company's core business and how do they feel about innovation? Um, if, if that's something that's important to you. And for me, it, it, was, it was very important. So sorry, just some random thoughts about what I wish in school and what I thought. I think we're almost out of time. Is that true? Yeah, we're uh, about two minutes left. So we have a question from Zach here, if you're open to another question. Oh yeah, for sure. Take as many questions. So when you said that uh, to just post like what we're doing in school on LinkedIn, a lot of this 
basically all of my time was spent like doing homework. So would we just post kind of homework stuff and um, or would it be more in the I guess random free time that we have and then also to the project? I guess I just don't understand what you're saying by posting what we're doing. Yeah, and I, I don't know if I fully do either because I didn't do it. Um, but but for instance, <clears throat> whenever you have like a project in a course, so just just for example, um, in uh, in my master's degree, I had a machine learning course, and we had a final project where we got to choose something and just use machine learning um, to like solve a problem. And I chose trying to predict the stock market, right? And I, I had to write a report for the class, and I just turned it in, got an A on the assignment, right? Whatever, and kind of just out of like like on a whim, I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna post this to LinkedIn. And still to this day, that report on my like findings from trying to predict the stock market with machine learning is like my most liked post on LinkedIn almost. Um, and so it's just like any sort of report that you've done for a project, or even if it's like a homework problem, just like explaining how you solved it, or just like what you learned <clears throat> less about like the technical maybe, and like just more about like the like, oh yeah, this taught me how to solve problems or like people love stories like that. I, I don't fully know what I would have done. Um, any project is for sure, like definitely post about that. Um, or like anything like Professor Hedengren says, that's really interesting, maybe post about that. You know, um, like, oh yeah, my professor said this today, I really agree. Um, homework, I don't know, maybe if it's interesting enough. Um, yeah, maybe uh, quotes, I don't know. Just anything. I here's another thing. I, I'm really big, you know. Obviously, I try to run a business now. Um, there's a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk who I follow a lot, and he's a business guy. And he's like, never judge your own content. He's like, you never know what people are gonna like. So just throw it out there. And if it flops, it flops, but you never know. It could take off and it could help you find your next job. So you really have nothing to lose, in my opinion. Yeah, you guys have a project, so uh I think that's good fodder too. I mean, I'll say this, you guys are doing a very interesting project. If you want to post that, I think that's if you want to do an interesting project. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's great. And, you know, this is this is excellent, Avery. I really like what you've done today in terms of not only showing some of the technical side, but also some of the, the soft skills needed to succeed and kind of find um, you know where your drive is and how you're gonna make an impact. So uh, and you've certainly done that. You know, you've taken this, uh, you've taken kind of a non-traditional route. I think, you know, both myself, uh, you know, working at ExxonMobil and now back at Academia, and Dr. Powell, same thing, you worked at Exxon and back in Academia. You know, there's kind of that drive, once you've developed those skills to be kind of a, um, you know, direct a lot of your own work and choose your own path. So I think that's one of the things that data science and machine learning that gives you is it gives you that freedom to say, hey, these are the things I want to pursue. This is what I'm passionate about. And there's so much demand out there right now that a lot of times that's possible um, you know, with this field. So uh, I really appreciate your perspective. Um, and so let's give them a round of applause. For, uh, you guys are nice. Really appreciate that. And uh, you know, I think like, again, I Connect with him on LinkedIn. He's got a great network. He puts a lot of really interesting things. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to stay in touch. And when we can have you come to BYU and uh, visit the class, uh, we'd love to do that. Right now, visitors are, uh, they still don't want us to bring in visitors. But uh, when, once that's allowable and you're still local, we'd love to have you come. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And uh, fun talking to you guys. Would love to talk to you on LinkedIn. I am, I am hiring. I, I don't know if any of you guys have the, I need a specific skill set, but also if you guys want a job, maybe there's an opportunity. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Avery.